Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome, friends and family, to our Boring Meditation Stuff, September 22nd. Um, yesterday we were talking about tribes and the idea that a quality meditation practice has these two aspects pertaining to tribes. One is that anyone from any tribe can practice that meditation, and the other is that um, the meditation itself should really start helping you see how incredibly artificial all of these tribes actually are. Um, there is, of course, a lot of nuance to that, right? It's not that the tribes are meaningless. Um, if you were to say, oh, the tribes of racism, the tribes of race, well, they don't exist and they don't mean anything. Well, obviously, that's an incredibly naive attitude to take. Racism exists. Um, race is a social construct which helps certain groups of people oppress certain other groups of people in myriad ways. It isn't a simple, uh, well, these people are good and these people are bad and these people are being abused by the bad people and the bad people made up all the races. Um, it is a huge complicated subject but the fact of the matter is, is that race doesn't really exist. It exists in our minds, and to some extent it exists in terms of bone structure and, and skin pigments and things like that, but like these are fairly insignificant genetic traits um, in the, the expanse of the genome, right? Um, so this idea of... Um, of tribalism and tribes, um, I, I don't want to oversimplify anything there, but um, I think that it is important for people to keep in mind that these things are artificial and that um, meditation can provide you an avenue to see through their artificial nature. Now, what is this avenue? This avenue is a process um, of differentiation and um, what are you differentiating? You are differentiating yourself from yourself. So differentiation is easy for us to do when it comes to um, external things, right? So as a young child, we learn to differentiate colors, this color is green, this color is blue, uh, numbers, this number is three, this, this number is seven. Um, and we begin to make utility out of that process of differentiation. We start to find patterns and then we learn through pattern matching and then we apply those patterns in ways which themselves, the applications themselves, tend to be more patterns and this becomes a kind of constructive activity. Um, Differentiation in meditation is, meditation is quite a bit different. Um, there is no real constructive activity to, to go about. It is purely observational. So what we're going to do is, say, take our body, right? And we'll differentiate the right-hand side, this is my right-hand side, from the left-hand side. And we'll say, okay, slice it in half. And what's going on? What's different? about these two halves. And we begin this process with Anapana um, with the most kind of fundamental differentiation that we can make in a left-right sense, which is the left nostril or the right nostril. Well, where is the air coming out of? Which nostril is active? Or are they both active? Um, and then we start to differentiate in Anapana meditation over time. So we differentiate from one moment to the next. Is the breath coming in or is the breath going out? Does the breath coming in have a particular quality? Does the breath going out have a particular quality? Is it long? Is it short? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it hot? Is it cold? Um, all of these really kind of basic questions that we can ask about um, the breath as 
uh, as it varies, right? Um, and it varies mostly over time. So the left-right differentiation, yeah, okay, that's helpful. It helps you kind of locate the breath. Um, but the differentiation over time is the most useful differentiation that comes out of Anapana meditation. Because what we find is that time is an incredibly relative thing. Um, our perception of time is based on our ability to distinguish one event from its next most adjacent event to our perception, right? So if we are experiencing real mental difficulty, psychic difficulty, uh, maybe we perceive one day at a time, right? That's conceivable. Um, I think maybe to uh, a mind which is undergoing trauma or incredible stress or I don't know, schizophrenia, maybe something like that. It might be the case that you, like the mind is, is only aware of these gross time frames, one day, half a day, six hours at a time. Um, and the mind that is incredibly sharp is aware of very tiny slices of time, incredibly tiny slices of time. So we tend to think of one second as being a relatively small amount of time, but there's a lot of little bits of time within one second that can be observed through a meditation practice. So we sit for Anapana meditation, and if we sit for long enough and we're patient enough, we start to find that within the scope of any given breath, there are many, many moments of time. And what's funny about this is as we start to tease these bits of time apart, we learn how to tease other things apart. So other parts of ourself. Um, we can differentiate the left side from the right side. We can differentiate the top from the bottom. And ultimately, the intention of Vipassana meditation is to start investigating this physical phenomenon of the body in tiny, tiny increments. Um, it takes a while <laughs> to learn this um, and then to practice it because you have to practice it. But what you find is, oh, from any given second to any given other second, um, from any moment to any other moment, I'm a wildly different person. Um, I am changing quite a lot. And not only am I changing over time, but I'm changing from one part of the body to another part of the body. Um, and that, that's a bit of a difficult concept to grasp without experiencing it firsthand. And I recommend doing that, experience it firsthand. Um, but what's strange about it is this uh, externalization. So a person gets up from meditation and having worked on this differentiation, seeing how complex an individual human being is, we start to see the complexities of the outside world very differently. So we begin to understand um, exactly how are these structures which cause and reinforce our society and our tribes and our ways of thinking operating. Um, how do these ideas manifest? How do they sustain themselves? How do they pass away? Um, and what are they exactly? And um, this process is, is somewhat counterintuitive because you would think the way to learn about tribes and religions and races and cultures and countries would be to study those things. Um, but sometimes the study of those topics is so embedded in the structures, which uh, reinforces the topics themselves, that it's really difficult to actually study the topic objectively. It's much easier oddly enough, to study yourself and see, oh, okay, the way that I am built up, 
is the same way that all of these other imaginary things are built up, um, be they religion or country or caste or, or whatever. Um, and then through collective belief, we have this idea, oh, okay, here I am in the country of India. Um, what does that collective belief mean? What are the consequences of that collective belief? And you can start teasing apart that thing as well, a little more rationally than a person who is only trying to examine that thing in the context um, where it's presupposed. It's presupposed, oh, there is a country, India. That's a thing that exists. That's a real thing. Just because we all believe that India exists, therefore it exists. Um, the helicopter has come, the evening helicopter, which means I should probably bring this to a close. Um, I will try to address a difficult topic with respect to the concept of tribes and um, the abuse of tribes in the next video, if I can at all. Wish me luck. <laughs> all right. Uh, I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves and taking good care of everyone around them. And I will talk to you tomorrow for that topic. Goodbye.